as we move through this conversation and we, you know, for our next speaker, Nat Kendall Taylor, um, I'm just going to open a question to you all. How many times have you met an academic anthropologist, right, who says that you know, just with, with no sense of irony, I just want to help make real change happen, right? Uh, well, today we are one for one on that one. Uh, Nat Kendall Taylor is an anthropologist, and he is also the chief executive officer uh, of the Frameworks Institute. So Nat oversees the organization's pioneering research-based approach, research-based approach to strategic communications. There he is. Um, and they, they use methods from social and behavioral science to measure how people understand complex issues and then test the ways to reframe them, right, to drive social change, right? He's also the senior fellow at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University, a visiting professor at the Child Study Center at Yale School of Medicine. And he's a guy who told me straight out, uh, yeah, I, I'm so, I know some things and I can do some things. Um, and he's pretty confident that those things can help us change how people are, interact with diabetes and the stigma that surrounds it. So now let me introduce you all to Nat Kendall Taylor. Nat, take it away. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share my screen here. Just give me one second. Um, and I should be good. Well, thank you very much. Um, and it's important to know that after I said that to David, I said, but there's a whole lot more that I don't know, just so you have some sense of my uh, hopefully um, humble presentation of what is to come. I just want to say that I'm super glad that that video worked because if it didn't, I was going to be a dismal and very disappointing consolation prize to um, Anthony Anderson. So this is this is going great. I'm so glad that, that worked and I'm so glad that I get to be here with you all to do my absolute favorite thing in the world, which is to talk about framing. Um, and I realize that's utterly sad and pathetic, uh, but it does mean that for the next 15 minutes, there's going to be one person on this call who's having a good time. That will be me. I will have fun. Um, I wanted just to thank the Diatribe Foundation for inviting me, and no offense, but the most important thank you is to all of you who are on the line right now spending your time uh, with us. And I, I realize that time is very valuable, and in exchange for that time, I'm going to do my absolute best to use the next 15 minutes to be as 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 utterly helpful as possible, um, talking about something that is pretty far outside the medical field and certainly um, the, the diabetes field. Um, so that's really important that you know that I'm neither of those two things. So I'm not an expert in diabetes and um, I am a doctor, but I'm not the kind of doctor that, that stands up um, when someone asks if they're a doctor on the plane. I'm a psychological anthropologist by training. Uh, and what I do and have done for the last 20 years is study how culture influences the way that people think, how people use culture to process information, to make meaning of messages, uh, and to formulate and reach decisions. Uh, and so I'm, I'm super glad to be here with you today. And one of my goals is that at least one of you is at least half as excited about culture and framing um, after I'm finished here. I think I can do it. I'm a fan of, of nice uh, low bars, so, so let's get to it. Um, at the beginning, so I'm going to be talking about framing for the next 15 minutes. I think it's important that we establish a, a kind of common definition of what that term means. It's one of these, these words like narrative change that has become so ubiquitous that um, I fear it has lost any and all meaning it ever once it's had. So what we mean on this call, what I mean for the next uh, 14 minutes is by framing is um, the choices that we all make and how we present information. Uh, and sometimes those are those are really small choices and, and seem rather insignificant. The pronouns that we use, whether we talk about us and them or whether we talk about we and ours, the verbs that we choose and how those verbs either imply or deny agency to various groups of people, as well as the really uh, kind of more obvious and in your face choices that we make as communicators, the values that we endorse to argue for why addressing an issue is so important, the metaphors we choose to explain how something works. Framing is about how all of those choices, big and small, that we make as communicators, and I'm going to argue that each and every one of us on this webinar right now is a communicator. Framing is about how those choices influence how people think, how they feel, and what they are or are not willing to do as a result of hearing what we have to say. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you an example of, of what this looks like. Um, as I said, I'm not an expert in 
the field of diabetes, nor am I an expert in framing diabetes, but I have worked on a number of issues that have kind of as their crux or as their turning challenge, this issue of, of stereotype and stigma. So I've picked an example that comes from some work that my organization, the Frameworks Institute, has done on uh, framing child mental health. Uh, and so we work with an organization uh, who has as their mission to take the science of early childhood development and translate it for people who are in policy and practice making positions. Um, and these scientists struggle mightily to communicate uh, the particular concept within the larger field of early childhood and child mental health. So Americans, uh, most Americans don't believe that very young children can even have states of mental health. Um, and they're also not wildly supportive of using more public funds to, to support the mental health of young children. So that, is, that was really our challenge in this piece of work, um, to figure out ways of, of framing, of communicating the issue of child mental health that um, increased people's sense of the importance of the issue, what we call in communications salience, so kind of its top of mindness, where it sits in the issue agenda amongst other social issues, and then really pragmatically to increase support for the kinds of policies and programs that intervention science has shown are effective in uh, improving healthy child development and supporting child mental health. Um, so you're going to see one particular piece of that larger research project. It's, an, uh, it's a survey. It's an experimental survey that was conducted with just over 6,000 um, people. Uh, and this, uh, how this experiment works is that each of those 6,000 people is randomly assigned to, uh, to, to read a message on the screen. And the message is basically a description of a child mental health program except it's framed at the top with a value. So um, a third of the people who are on this experiment get randomly assigned to a value of future progress and social prosperity. So they would read an opening to this description that sounds something like, we need to do a better job um, of addressing child mental health because, and we wouldn't say it in such a hackneyed and cliched way, because children are our future, right? They're, they're stable, they're, they're solid, uh, mental health is really important uh, to our ability to progress as a country, to move forward and be successful. Um, the other, another third randomly assigned of the, the larger sample uh, gets assigned to hear the value of vulnerability. So they read the same 80 words, right? It's the same description of the program, except the lead in the first 10 to 15 words at the top is different. So instead of social progress and prosperity, these folks would read something like, it's important that we do a better job to support children's mental health because children are our most vulnerable citizens. They deserve our empathy and our compassion and we must feel for them and do better by them. Um, and then yes, I can do math. That leaves one third of the sample which gets assigned to the control condition. So the control condition uh, in this case is people who see no message, right? They read no message, they are this, this thin uh, zero line that you see across the middle of the screen. Um, and then everyone, regardless of what frame, what message they were exposed to, answers the same set of questions, which are designed to measure how supportive they are of this set of evidence-based policies. So what you're gonna see on the next screen are what I think are two absolutely gorgeous green bars are gonna appear. And those green bars are gonna show you the extent to which hearing those two different frames, right, the different ways that the issue are framed affects people's support for those policies. Um, and, and I don't know the kind of statistical acumen of, of this audience, so I'll give you a, a quick stats uh, lesson in, uh, in regression analysis. Up is good uh, and down is, is not good. So you see on the left-hand side of the screen that value of collective progress and, and prosperity is having a strong and statistically significant positive effect on people's support for those policies. Um, that's good news when we get those kind of results. There's a little framing dance uh, that we do. Uh, don't worry, David, I will not do it uh, now for anyone here um, on the webinar, but your eyes probably also wandered towards the right-hand side of the screen where you see, um, you see news that is decidedly less positive. So that value of vulnerability um, is not only zero, which remember is no message, but it is actually depressing people's support for these policies that the field is advocating for. So let me translate that for you. If you're an expert or an advocate working on issues of child mental health in the United States and you use value of vulnerability to frame your messages, you not only waste your breath, 
you not only waste your valuable communications resources, but you use those very resources in a way that directly disadvantages your goals as, as experts, as advocates, as researchers. And just to be clear, when it comes to communications, that is not what you want to be doing. That is not good news. Um, the really interesting thing is that after this experiment, we conducted a systematic analysis of all of the fields, external facing communications over a three year period. So this is all the websites, the press releases, the blogs, uh, the mission statements, the pamphlets. And guess which value we found to be used in over 90% of those communications. Uh, and because of this format, that has to be a rhetorical question, unfortunately. Um, that is the value of vulnerability, right? So what we found, in essence, that for a long time, with a shocking amount of resource, the field had essentially been using a value that, again, not only wasted those resources, but uses, used those resources in a way that directly disadvantaged their goals as, as advocates. Um, so I've come to, to think about framing through a metaphor. Um, and it's the idea that these frames that we that we use and choose, these choices that we make as communicators, um, are not just kind of purple prose that sound good and adorn our information, but rather they are these vital keys uh, that we have that can unlock thinking, uh, that can create space for people to engage with our issues in new ways, that can advance and provide a channel for people to come to support the kind of solutions that we know are vital and important to addressing a problem. That's the, that's the kind of optimistic um, entailment of the key metaphor. The, the negative entailment, the negative meaning is that those frames can also do the opposite, right? The choices that we make inadvertently, in the case of vulnerability, lock down thinking, uh, kind of uh, freeze up understanding, uh, have people reject our messages, or worse, have them take the exact opposite um, uh, message that we intend from our communications away from, from that engagement. And we know that framing uh, has always mattered. So I've been doing framing for a very long time. It has mattered for each and every year, for each and every month, for each and every minute that I have done it. But it is really important and has really mattered uh, in some obvious ways over the last seven months. And I have collected over the last seven months examples of framing uh, that there is really solid research shows has some unintended or in some cases intended but negative effects. And so I wanted to just take you through a number of these. And I think that both the child mental health and the vulnerability example is well chosen, I hope, uh, for the work that you all do. And I hope that these examples also illustrate and provide some commentary on some of the main framing challenges and framing effects that exist around the issue of diabetes. So the first and the most obvious uh, is the one um, that emerged early on in the pandemic where the, the, the pandemic was, was labeled uh, the Chinese virus. And this is the very uh, well studied um, and accepted finding is that what this framing does, and I would argue deliberately, is it creates a palpable fear of other, others. Uh, it creates a kind of insular nationalism. And, and most interestingly and important, it, it elicits um, a sense of racism or a racist response that we have found not only attaches to the group at which this frame is directed, but in some really ugly uh, ways, kind of wiggles and wanders and attaches to all different kinds of groups of people around which there are uh, well-held societal and cultural stereotypes. The second one, uh, one of my personal favorites, is the way in which public health measures have been labeled as draconian in their approach. And what this does really strongly uh, and immediately is create the sense that these measures are an obvious overreaction um, and elicits a sense in which we are resistant to information and hesitant to act on, on what is vital public health advice. Um, another one which relates to the child mental health one is all the ways in which certain groups of people are being labeled uh, repeatedly and explicitly as vulnerable. Um, I think this is most uh, pernicious when it comes to how um, older Americans, older people are being labeled. Um, and we know uh, in the last seven months, but there's a long and rich uh, history of, of scholarship that looks at vulnerability framing and finds that what it does is it instantly others, right? It instantly creates an us and them perspective. Uh, it creates really strong zero sum thinking in which any more for, for, for they and them over there means less for me and mine over here. Um, and it perpetuates stigma. Stigma not only in terms of how we think about certain groups of people, uh, but as Rebecca talked about how groups, how individuals within that group think about themselves. Imagine being in a group uh, and being told continually, repeatedly over time, that your group as a group is being essentialized as vulnerable and what kind of effects that that would have on your identity and all kind of behaviors and health impacts that ensue. Another one uh, that we've been seeing a lot is um, 
people of color uh, are being infected or dying at higher rates. And there's really good research that shows that what this does um, is that it, it unfortunately does not send people's attention going to the structures and the systems that, um, that explain uh, this phenomenon, but actually sends people back to blaming individuals and their choices and their health behaviors uh, and their quote unquote values um, in, in creating these disparities. Um, and last but not least, uh, related to, but, but uh, kind of the, the, the second um, issue that we've been um, up against over the last uh, not quite seven months is this call to confront racism um, and how we have seen that this is some framing effects that go on here, right? Uh, and what this does is that, again, it doesn't send people focusing on the systemic and structural features of racism, and instead it leads people to blame um, the kind of bad apples that have hateful or backward ways of thinking and to try to root them out of systems rather than to change the systems in which they are operating um, and embedded. Uh, and so I want to end with uh, a quote. Uh, this is one of my favorite new quotes about framing. It's from a guy named Charles, Charles Eisenstein, who is a, I think he calls himself a philosopher. He is a purveyor of awesome quotes. Uh, and this is really um, a powerful way to think about framing and what it can do for a social issue like the one that you work on. And so Charles Eisenstein said, the world as we know it is built on a story. And to be a change agent is first to disrupt the existing story of the world and second to tell a new story of the world so that people have a place to go. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. I'd like to encourage you all to go out and frame on. Thank you, Nat. Uh, wow. I mean, uh, so, so I am, a, I am officially now super excited by framing. So you have succeeded. Um, as a side note, I, I might still hold you to that framing dance. Uh, we might need to see that in the Q and A. So just heads up, get ready, um, work on your camera angle. Uh, but I think this whole, this whole notion of framing, you know, obviously from where I come from in terms of method acting, everything is a communication, right? But to, it's one thing to know everything is a communication, but to see the power of that communication, right, is is really impactful, right? And this this last notion last notion of disrupting the story is incredibly powerful. So um, I think one of the things I would add to Eisenstein's uh, uh, quote is to, for us to recognize as we're going to disrupt the story, know that we're part of it, that we're actually part of telling this story. Right. The, the way that we communicate, the way we frame, the way we live, frankly, the way I have lived my life as a person with diabetes contributes in at least some way to the framing uh, and therefore to the story. Right. So there is responsibility on us and opportunity um, both together. Those two, those two things always come in the bundle together. But uh, uh, thank you for adding that to our conversation today.